hey, it's Miss Cole, and I'm going to share another poem with you today, as well as do some exploration and thinking about why the poet made the choices that he did. And I say he because in this case, it is To Failure by Philip Larkin. You do not come dramatically with dragons that rear up with my life between their paws and dash me butchered down beside the wagons, the horses panicking, nor as a clause clearly set out to warn what can be lost, what out-of-pocket charges must be borne, expenses met, nor as a drafty ghost that's seen some mornings running down the lawn. It is these sunless afternoons I find install you at my elbow like a boar. The chestnut trees are caked with silence. I am aware the days pass quicker than before. Smell staler, too. And once they fall behind, they look like ruin. You have been here some time. So, when we look at the text of this poem, you can kind of tell that it's supposed to be a poem because it's laid out in lines. It's not set up in paragraphs, which are one of the basic units of prose, of what we consider typical communication. Just sentences, paragraphs, that's the way we structure those. This is set out in lines that break when there's not a sentence there. Larkin does choose to capitalize the beginning of each line, regardless of whether or not a sentence starts there. That's another clue. This isn't prose, it's poetry. Additionally, we have it set up in stanzas. So we have one larger stanza and a second smaller stanza. And if we count it up, we can see that there's 14 lines. Hmm. You may be aware that there's a special type of poem that has 14 lines, and it's called a sonnet. The sonnets we tend to be most familiar with They have a particular rhyme scheme. Quite often, we're most familiar with the Elizabethan or Shakespearean sonnet, which uses A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F, G, G. So three quatrains, three groups of four, and then a couplet, a group of two. This one doesn't do that. That's because this is a different kind of sonnet. It's called a Petrarchan sonnet. And so a Petrarchan sonnet is set up in an octet, which is a group of eight, which we've got, and a sestet, which is a group of six. So here we can also see that the rhyme scheme isn't the same as an Elizabethan sonnet. Here we have dragons, which rhymes with wagons, paws rhymes with claws, and then we have lost, born, ghost, and lawn. Well, born and lawn definitely rhyme, but ghost and lost, they don't have the same sound. But when we look at them, They both end in O-S-T, which gives us not just the last consonant blend, but also the vowel before it. So that whole syllable, apart from the first consonant blend, matches. So visually, this looks like it would rhyme because the words are spelled the same towards the end. So this is an example of a visual rhyme, even though when we say it, the words don't sound like they rhyme. So they're being used as a rhyme because of the way that they're spelled. So it does still fit the pattern. It's just the poet chose to use a little bit of a different kind of a rhyme there. And that's one of the things that we want to talk about is these choices. This is about failure. I think it's pretty obvious. The title definitely helps. And so again, all of those are choices. To failure is that this is written as what's called an ode. It is a poem that is addressed to a person, or in this case, to a concept. Notice that it starts with the word you. It's as though the poet is talking to failure, like failure is some kind of person. Not that it is, but let's use our imaginations. So again, that's a choice. It's being addressed to failure directly. You could make a case that that's a type of personification. Failure is being personified here as though that's who the poet is talking to. You do not come dramatically with dragons. So we have some figurative language there. You are not an attacker. And we have that metaphor is then extended. And I'm wondering, does it count as a metaphor if it's emphasizing not a similarity, but a difference? Because it's it's not saying that failure is a dragon. In fact, it's saying that failure isn't a dragon. We're emphasizing what we might expect from failure and then 
indicating that that's not actually how it happened. So we have this very vivid um, word picture of the dragons attacking this caravan of travelers, um, the horses and the wagons, you know, the, the wagons getting destroyed and the body of the poor poet being dropped down and the horses rearing up and panicking and dashing away, perhaps. And then we have a contrast as well, a legal document, a clause that tells us here's what's going to happen if you don't do this. It's not that straightforward either. It's not dramatic. It's not clear and straightforward. Um, and also, it doesn't give you that spooky chill of a frosty morning when the sun's just coming up and you look at what was that? Just out of the corner of your eye, you see a ghost that's just like crossing the lawn far away. Is it going to come and get you? So it, it doesn't give you that sort of prickle on the back of your neck. These are all the things that failure is not. And that is, all of those are clustered together. So then we have the break between the octet, that first stanza, and the sestet, that second shorter stanza. So notice that in the first stanza, it's all about what failure is not. And then we switch to the second stanza. And so again, that's a choice. The stanza kind of holds together. The first one's all about what failure is not, and the second one is all about what failure actually is. Maybe not what you were expecting. It seems kind of ordinary. You know, let's look at those those last six lines. Sunless afternoons. It's kind of cloudy. Bleh. You're like a person that I don't want to listen to who's sitting here talking to me. A bore. And you're still talking. And I'm trying not to pay attention to you. I don't want to. The chestnut trees are caked with silence. They're just trees. They're not spooky whistling pines or bright colorful maple trees. They're chestnut trees. Pretty ordinary. They're silent. Nothing much is going on. The days are passing quicker. Huh. And there's this stale smell to them, like nothing much has been happening. Maybe it should have been. Maybe I should have been getting some work done. Huh. And so it's this growing sense of maybe more should have been happening than I've actually been getting done. And it grows until that last half of the final line. You've been here a while. <laughs> so let's take a look um, at the structure of the octet and the sestet. So we talked about dragons, paws, wagons, claws. So we have A, B, A, B, lost, born, ghost, lawn, C, D, C, D. That would be similar to the first two stanzas of an Elizabethan sonnet. However, we get more of a change. There's also a line break there that separates those two uh, sections. It is the sunless afternoons I find, bore. I'm isn't a perfect rhyme with find, but if we are familiar with the pattern and we start looking at the way this is structured, that's an example of a slant rhyme. It uses that long I sound to set up the match between find and I'm. So bore rhymes with before and then behind and time. Actually, I need to check that because find I'm. So no, it's C-D-E-C-D. Ah, that's interesting. I'm rhymes exactly with time. That's an interesting choice. Because my first instinct was that it was A, B, C, D, C, D. So E, F, E, but it's not. It's E, F, G, E, F, G. So, and, and that's a one, two, three, one, two, three. So again, that's a choice. Find and I'm are pretty close, but I'm and time are a clearer rhyme. Likewise, find and behind are a perfect rhyme. All that stuff that I said about a slant rhyme, I'm going to take that back because we have a perfect rhyme and there is a pattern to it. So I think that we could, we could make the case that it's E F E F E E. You could make the case for that, but I think a stronger case is that it's E, F, G, F, E, G. Looking at how they match there, okay? So when uh, in high school or college maybe, when you have a standardized test, quite often it'll say, look for the response that gives you the best answer. On the other hand, when you've got an essay test, in many cases, it's not just about getting the answer that the instructor is looking for. It's also about 
supporting your answer. And if you can come up with something new, something the instructor wasn't thinking about, you can say, here's the evidence from the text. Here's the reasoning that supports this is why this is the best answer. If you come up with a good answer and a good explanation that the teacher wasn't thinking of, let me tell you, we love that kind of thing. Teachers are suckers for that. We love it when a student comes up with something new and has good reasons to support it. So let's take a look back at this again in this second set. So in the first set, we see in the first octet, we see what failure is not. And in the second, we see what failure is. And it's not, it's not what was expected. It's not dramatic. It's not spooky. It's not obvious. Failure is something that creeps up on you until you realize, oh, I've missed the opportunities that I had. Now, of course, because this is a poem, it doesn't come right out and say that. One of the interesting and yet frustrating things about poetry is that it's not direct, which can be a struggle sometimes, but it invites an exploration. And that helps keep it interesting. And it also means that the listener or the reader has to be involved in thinking about and exploring the ideas that are being described and, and explored here. The poet invites you to explore these ideas with him. And if you can think back into your own life and things that haven't gone the way you've wanted them to, then there's a really good chance that you'll see some cases when maybe it did happen dramatically. But you'll also see some cases where it kind of crept up on you the way that the poet is describing it here. In this case, he's talking about an afternoon, the days passing quickly, and failure having been there sometime. It makes me feel like he's talking about trying to write poems and not really getting a lot done. But he doesn't say that. And so when I think back about it, and when I look specifically in the poem, and I notice that's not there, when I think back, I realize that's what I'm bringing to it. I'm seeing that because <laughs> I've had the experience of realizing that, oh, you know, I have to get up and go do something else. And I was going to finish writing my video script. And I've been surfing social media for like the last hour and a half. And I didn't realize how much time had passed. And I don't have my script done. Or I don't have the papers graded. Or, oh no, I put something in the oven and it smells like maybe I should have checked on it 15 minutes ago and I didn't. And, you know, now I'm going to have to scrub out the pot because whatever I was cooking is burned on the bottom. Not that I would know anything about that. So a well-crafted poem invites the audience to participate in exploring the idea with the poet. That's one of the things that Larkin is doing here, giving specific examples that describe and explore the idea, developing the idea through these specific examples, and then providing just enough detail that the audience can then make connections to their own experiences in their own lives and connect with it and make meaning together. And that's what makes poetry special. That it's not just what the creator thinks. It invites the audience to participate too. Thanks so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed this poem. And if you have some favorite poems that you want to share with me that you or that you're not really sure you understand and you'd like me to take a look at, you know what a sucker I am for comments. So, be a comment. Bye for now, everybody.